Rick, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining me. It's great to be here, Mike. Thanks for having me. Hundred percent, dude. So, for people that don't know you and your story, give us the spark notes. You know who you are, where are you coming from, what yeah. are you doing now? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, my background is at actually in athletics. I grew up uh, playing sports, so I was really kind of found a liking to football. Had a lot of success playing that growing up. Uh, got a scholarship to the University of Arizona. Played for Mike Stoops for the in the early two thousands. Had a good career there. I was a three-year starter, led the Pac-10 in multiple stat categories, and then ended up being drafted in 2011 and living out my childhood dream. Um, I always say I was not, you know, a very uh, athletically gifted guy. You know, I, I, I say I kind of go towards the the average of, you know, all the, the athletes that are in the NFL, a lot of the hard workers. But um, I basically, when I got done with football, I took everything that made me successful as an athlete and just applied it to my, I guess, life after sport in my corporate world. I got into medical device sales and marketing for six years, um, kind of found out after year five or six, that was not going to be for me. It was, uh, you know, I saw a lot of my senior mentors that were, you know, divorced or didn't really have like lives outside of work. And I knew I did not want that. So I went back and did my uh, MBA in 2017. And uh, during my MBA in 2017, I was in a marketing class and I had a an epiphany entrepreneurial seizure moment. You know, I heard something in a class and I just thought it was going to be a really good business idea. And I had a marketing professor say handwritten notes had a 99.2% open rate and a 100% read rate. And I just thought that was just such an, uh, an amazing statistic. And uh, I, I thought, you know, right off the top, if I can make a business around handwritten notes and helping companies automate and scale it, there may be something there. So yeah, that's a little quick high level overview from my athletic corporate and just, you know, where the idea for my current venture started. Dude, I, I love it. And I'm so curious about the venture that you're building right now, because I think um, I've always been fascinated by those statistics. And like, I, for whatever reason, Gary V's voice is like imprinted in my head right now of like, scale the unscalable type of thing. But it <laughs> sounds like you're helping people scale what used to seem unscalable. Uh, and I really want to dive into that. Before we do, uh, who did you get drafted by? Uh, the Green Bay Packers. Oh, okay. That's yeah. acceptable. Yeah, so like, it was like Don Packers. Capers. Yeah, that was back when uh, – uh, what is the coach of the Cowboys' name? Um, uh, Mike McCarthy was the head coach. It was yeah. a year after they won the Super Bowl. Clay Matthews played behind Clay Matthews. Yeah, it was a, it was a very interesting experience, <laughs> to That's say true. the least. What yeah. uh, What position were you? Linebacker. Oh, okay. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Um, did you spend your whole career there or like how, how much time did you spend? The oh, year? no. So I had the, the typical journeyman career. So um, I was drafted there uh, late in the sixth round. So it was later uh, in the NFL draft, but uh, I started with the Packers. I got cut by the Packers. And then um, usually what happened is I'd start with a team during the off season would be released and then picked up by another team during the, the year. And a lot of people don't realize that. Like that's like 90% of the athletes yeah. in the NFL is their one-year contracts. You know, you may hear them sign a four-year contract, but they're really day-to-day. -day. So um, yeah. I was very thankful, you know, built a lot of character to say the least. Uh, and I got to travel the country and live out my childhood dream. Dude, that's so awesome. I, um, I always joked, I basically grew up in Giant Stadium because my uh my grandfather played for the giants like pre-world war ii leather helmet era no so way. We've, like we've always had tickets in the family that's um, awesome so i was hoping you didn't say anything ridiculous like the eagles or the cowboys <laughs> or anything like that yeah um, but that's awesome i i grew up i like the my dad liked the packers growing up that was one of his teams that he liked so that's cool nice. um Talk to me about the transition from, uh, like at what point did you decide to pull the plug on the athletics and move into, I think you said med device sales was the first thing post yeah. athletics. What, what was that pivot like? You know, so what was keeping my, you know, every year in the NFL, you're basically signed to like a one-year contract. They call it a futures contract. Unless you're like, you know, the top 1%, you're getting these like six year multi-million, you know, nine figure contracts or, you know, or seven or yeah, seven or eight figure contracts. Um, and going out of my third season, I had a futures contract with the Indianapolis Colts. 
my body was just banged up. You know, I shipped my truck all over the country at that time. I've been with my wife for 16 years. You know, she was following me all over there, all over the country. And I just, you know, you just kind of know, you know, I felt like I was like one bad play away from like ripping my hamstring and blowing out my knee. And I played football for since I was nine until I was 25. So 16 years. And I, I got to play that sport without getting injured. So I was like, man, I think, you know, there's something there telling me I, this is the time to be finished. But um, I think you got to, you know, listen to your gut or listen to your, like your inner self talk, but also take like a practical approach to it because your inner self talk can also be lying to you at sometimes because you're just tired. But, um, you know, I, I sat down talked to my family. I really thought about, you know, where I was, where I wanted to go. And it was just time to do something else. That last bit that you just shared is, I, I think most people forget to talk about that part. And I'm so glad you highlighted it, which it's was a, like, every entrepreneur has it. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. Like when is your self-talk lying to you? Because it's your 2000 year old brain trying to keep you safe. How did you yeah. like, have you always been aware of that? Or how did you know to like try and decipher? And how did you decipher between, am I just bitching out right now? Or is this like really what I'm supposed to be herded towards? So I, I, feel like I've always been very logical and spiritual and I want to say like religion spiritual but I've always had like an inner self-talk about things that I wanted to do one of things I wanted to accomplish my goals um I think physically your body gets tired um but your mind right I think your mind is a lot stronger than your body and you can keep going you know there's days you know I'm five years into running my own business where like, I won't even, I'll be thinking about all these goals that I want to be doing. And then like, I naturally want, just want to say like, man, I'm just tired. <laughs> I'm just like, I'm physically tired. Like, yeah. but logically it's like, Hey, like you can keep going. Right. But it's like, how do you not overwhelm yourself, stress yourself out? And I think that's the balance people need to have. And um, what I think people do is they get burnt out and they quit versus learning how to just slow down and rest. And I think that's what it allowed me to number one, push my football career as long as I did um, without getting injured. And then also allow me to self fund um, with this business, which is a multi seven figure business. Now it's a technology, software, robotics, you know, industrial automation business. And I can dive into that, but we've been able to do this because of being able to keep walking forward. Even though if we fall down, we get back up. Um, you know, failures, you know, you may fail sometimes, but it's not fatal, right? You got to learn from it and keep moving forward. And I think the internal struggle as a business owner is going to be your biggest hurdle, you know, that you'll ever go through. Um, all the other stuff can be figured out over time, but if you can't figure out, you know, that person who's talking between your ears 24 seven, the person you have to live with and you can't get away, if you can't figure that out and take control of it. That's going to be the downfall, you know, of anything that you do, it doesn't matter if it's a business becoming a successful athlete. Um, it's the mental game for sure. Yeah, dude, you're speaking my language. I love that. It's, um, I think that most people, just like you said, they don't know how to build sustainability into their game plans. Like what, what you said that I loved is you knew when to rest instead of quit. And I think if most people knew how to rest or at the very least build their game plans in a sustainable way over the long term, like we work with a lot of sales guys. So it's like sales, like sales is numbers, just go put up bigger numbers. And then you burn out on day fucking yeah. three. Yeah. Like, well, I wonder why that happened. But if you can learn to build that sustainability in, learn to rest, then you can go for a way longer period of time and probably avoid a lot of the self-talk uh, that you don't need to need, need to yeah. deal with on a daily basis. I think you can avoid burnout if this is a lot of business owners, they don't have a plan or they don't have structure. They're just winging it 24 <laughs> seven. So they're just yeah. like, they're feeling like they're not getting anything done. And, you know, as my entire career as an athlete, there was structure. I knew where I was going to be at 9 a.m., 10 a.m., 11 a.m., you know, 2 p.m. I knew where I was going to be. There was structure. There was a process, right? And if you don't have systems in place, you don't have processes and processes in place, you know, you don't have clear objectives in place, you're just going to drive yourself crazy because you're going to feel like you're just not getting anywhere. So and it's going to be really hard to enjoy those small wins. So uh, that's what I've learned. You know, I, I have a coach, you know, he helps me figure this out. Um, 
you know, you have to be really, really enjoy what you're doing. Don't just chase the money because the money won't get you there. You're really going to have to absolutely love, you know, something about that journey. You know, as an athlete, you know, it was really hard, you know, for 10 years of that 16 years that I played, but I loved my position. I loved pass rushing. I loved getting sacks. I loved working out. So that helped me push through all the negativity. Um, or all the hard times or all the adversity I had to push through there. And as a business owner, I absolutely love learning. I love solving problems and to deal with, you know, everything that comes with running a business, like that what keeps me going and energized is like, man, I'm growing as a person, you know, I'm creating opportunities for the people around me. I'm learning, right. I'm building things. I'm becoming better. You know, I'm becoming Rick. Rick version 2.0, 3.0, 4.0. And that excites me. Yeah. So um, I think you just really got to, you know, to avoid burnout systems, processes, you got to have objectives, you got to have clear goals and you can't just, I, I was, I, I subscribed to that method for a long time and you do get burnt down. Burnout's a real thing. Your body will start screaming at you. Like <laughs> you yeah. will break down. Like you don't believe it until you go through it. So um yeah. You know, take every entrepreneur or for someone who's gone through that's word for it. You don't want to go through it because it's not fun. A hundred percent. Yeah. Did you mention that when you were an athlete, you had structure? Mm -hmm. I'm always curious how like skill sets and different characteristics of how we show up port over from area to area of our lives. And um, specifically for athletes, mainly selfishly, I'm always curious to compare to, to my journey, but like, did your work ethic directly translate from what I would call like the physical stuff to the more soft skill, like computer type work? Like, let me add context. Cause that's not a good, well-worded question when I'm in the gym and whether it was for my soccer career or competitive powerlifting or whatever it is, like if I had a workout to get done, there was no question it was going to get done. Mm -hmm. But I was fascinated how challenging it was in those first couple months when I was trying to take my business full time and left corporate in 2018. I was fascinated how long it took me to get into a routine and to get the work. Like I'm a very disciplined guy, but it was a struggle when I was sitting here on my laptop by myself all day instead of like someone else telling me what to do or whatever it might be. Did mm -hmm. you struggle with that transition at all? Or like, what did that look like? I for think you? the hardest thing about when you launch, you know, I, I actually left my W2 job at the end of 2017. So January 1, 2018 is when I started. And I think the hardest thing for me was, was when I was at a part of corporate America, you're basically on this big cruise ship, right? Everybody's on this boat. You have this big, powerful, highly financed, you know, company, big boat pushing forward down the seas that can handle lots of problems. You know, you don't notice the waves in the ocean, but then when you, you jump, you jump ship, right? And you go to like a solopreneur and you're trying to launch a business. Now you're in this dinghy. You have no gas. Like you don't even, you don't even have a fishing pole. Like you're taking your shoelace to try to catch a fish. And then like, you don't have water. Like you're trying to solve all these problems. And um, I think the big problem when you're first, you know, starting out and you're launching your business or trying something new is establishing that structure, you know, learning your surroundings, like, you know, establishing a schedule. Like, you know, if you're on that boat, I'm fishing in the morning, I'm getting water at 10 a.m., I'm cooking in the afternoon, I'm, you know, you got to find that schedule, you got to create that path. Um, but yeah, I think that was a very hard thing for me to do. It was go from that big cruise ship where we had everybody on it to getting on that solo boat to try to go find people to get on there. And now we're trying to build a boat, right? Or build an airplane as it's taking off. Like that's the analogy I always use as starting a business. It's like, I have this plane that's kind of flying and I'm trying to fix the wing that's broken and then putting gas in the engine over here, you know, and you know, oh, now the door's breaking. <laughs> so it's like, you got to be able to manage your stress. You got to be able to control your mind um, because when you get in the, those situations, when you're on your own for the first time, it takes mental toughness for sure to establish that routine to, you know, make clear decisions, you know, to make the right decisions for your business. And uh, it just takes time, but you know, failure is not fit. You know, failure is not fatal. It's not final. You just got to learn from your mistakes and keep moving forward. Do you think that, your discipline directly translated once that structure was I've built? had I've had tons of discipline my entire life I, and I I don't know why um I've I've always wanted to achieve a goal I feel like you know when you're born you're 
born with innate things. Yeah. And I just, I knew that, you know, I never got into partying drugs or alcohol because I knew those things would negate me from achieving my goals and dreams. Like my goals and dreams were more important to me. Um, they were bigger than me. I wanted to support my family and, and create opportunities for the people that are around me. And that drove me and my passion so much more to chase that versus the distractions that were over there. So yeah, I think discipline can be learned over time, but it's something that's really hard. You know, I, I have friends that are not disciplined and they may go through batches of time when they're disciplined, but you know, yeah. um, you know, it's easy for the people who are not disciplined to, you know, kind of stray off the path. Yeah. Yeah. I would agree with that. Um, let's talk about the new venture or not yeah. new. You've been building it for five years. It's a very large company, but like, talk to me about what you guys have going on. Um, and I'd love to dissect that a little bit. Yeah. So, listening. yeah. So simply noted, uh, you know, it began, at, it began in my house in 2017. We got our first space in 2018, just a little 900 square foot office, but simply noted it's the world's largest, um, handwritten notes, uh, handwritten notes or handwritten mail platform in the world. And what that means is we help companies either integrate and automate or scale sending genuine personalized handwritten notes. So uh, we help companies basically build better relationships, attract new business, you know, because the open rate with handwritten notes is so high. And we've kind of, you know, evolved into this kind of like software platform as a service company over the years. But yeah, we've I never thought I'd ever do this. You know, I'm a sports marketing guy, sales and marketing guy. Um, we've built our own handwriting robot. We've invested over $900,000 into this technology. Um, it's the best handwriting robot in the world. And why that matters, it means it's the most authentic product, you know, the fastest production times, the best quality. So we're really excited about what's going on over here. Um, you know, everybody lives in a digital world, you know, especially the last 20 plus years. Now we're in the AI world. I just truly believe business is lacking that personal touch and handwritten notes are going to make a, a comeback with a vengeance. And uh, we're just a platform that's going to help businesses uh, connect on a more personal level. It's, so you have a robot, like is a robot hand literally holding a pen and writing yeah. things based on what's prompted to it? Yeah. So we started with pen plotters, you know, back in 2017, figured out those weren't going to work. And then we moved to an auto pen, which was built in like the 19 late eighties, early nineties. And it was good enough to get started, but to create a platform um, and a business that, you know, we could scale or yeah. number one, control the quality. The quality wasn't very good. And we always got that feedback like, oh, this looks like a robot. And we just couldn't get around it. So we were forced to number one, or we had to build our own robot. Like I never wanted to, like I never thought I would have to. Like if I knew I was going to have to build my own robot in 2017, I probably wouldn't do it because it, I mean, it cost millions of dollars. Yeah, it's like, a lot. Yeah. So yeah, we built our own handwriting robot. There's, there's nothing on, I mean, we're gonna have six patents on it, three design, three utility. We're working through those right now. That's another thing I never thought I'd ever do is own a patent, but 100% um, of the design, we built our own motherboards, we built our own pens. Um, we built everything is custom built in house here. And it, it's a really cool process to see. That's so cool. What did you think it was going to be when you started? You know, I thought, <laughs> I mean, I thought this was going to take off a lot faster than it did. You know, I think like most do. business, yeah, every business, right? I told my wife, I was like, give me one year. Like, this is going to take off, you know? And then like six months in, you're like, oh, crap. Yeah. <laughs> this is going to be a lot harder. But, um, you know, I thought, you know, this was going to be something that was going to grow a lot faster. But um, I knew that when I was leaving corporate America, I had an itch I couldn't scratch. And entrepreneurship was going to fulfill that because of all the self-development that comes through it. I wasn't being challenged enough. I mean, every year I was either top 1% or top five like sales rep in my company. And it just was not rewarding. It was just like, they're keeping me in a box. You know, the only way to go up this ladder is to be miserable and divorced. Like I don't want to be a part of that. So, um, you know, it's just evolved though. Like everybody's journey. Like I thought we we're just going to be handwritten notes. We're just, people are going to send us list. Everybody was going to use us. And but to evolve our platform. We had to build software integrations. We integrate into like Salesforce, HubSpot. Um, never thought I was going to build software. Um, you know, now we're licensing our product to other companies. So companies are actually just integrating our service into their platform and reselling it for us. Never thought I'd have to do that. So it's really been a, a cool, like growing, learning 
evolving journey, which I know every entrepreneur will say this, like, you know, five years of becoming an entrepreneur will be, you know, more growth in those five years than 40 years in a, you know, corporate job, just because of how you evolve and how you grow. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I feel like this is a focal point of so many conversations lately, but like, it is the best personal development that you can do in my opinion. It is like, it's, um, it hurts. It hurts. Dude, <laughs> it's yeah, worth it sucks. It, yeah. it's, uh, like I, I feel one of my buddies said this, uh, he was like, I think as entrepreneurs, we're all just like masochists, right? Like just constantly inflicting self-harm, mm-hmm. uh, like enduring pain. Sure. Um, it's a good way to re- explain it. <laughs> But like, I mean, that's really what it feels like at times, but, but to your point, like for so many of us, there's an itch that cannot be scratched anywhere else. Like we need to be pursuing something greater than ourselves. And we'll go through seasons, of course, where it's like, maybe there's a season you got to stack cash or a season that you could just pour into R and D or whatever it is, but like, we need to do something else. Yeah. Um, What was that itch for you? Was it was it the freedom? Was it the curiosity? Like what, a, what so, about it for you? Drove yeah. You? I mean, I mean, I, I'll share, I guess, I mean, kind of a personal thing, but I'm happy to share it. Cause I know a lot of entrepreneurs have this same like chip on their shoulder. You know, I've been good at everything that I've, I've done. You know, I've been good at every sport. You know, I was good at skateboarding, good at basketball, good at football. I was good at my, my sales career, you know, but I've always been kind of chasing like greatness and, um, there was, you know, the only way for me to kind of prove to myself or kind of ch- get this chip off my shoulder was to build something that was mine. Um, I thought the business model was a great idea, but I wanted to prove to myself that, you know, my success wasn't because of a company that I was a part of. Um, my success wasn't because, you know, some type of, uh, what do you call it? relationship that I had, um, what do you call it? You know, nepotism, right? I didn't have any of that. Like my parents were, I grew up in a lower middle-class family, like I didn't have help, but you know, I I always had success in everything that I did, but I wanted to try something on my own and see if I was just kind of, I was successful because of those who were around me, which, you know, a lot of the times you are, you got to build a great team, but I didn't want to be, you know, known for a, you're just a football player, right? Or, hey, you were good at sales. Like, I wanted to keep evolving. I wanted to prove to myself that I can do it. I wanted to get this chip off my shoulder. And entrepreneurship was a way to tackle all those feelings at once, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, 100%. And, um, dude, I think a lot of people will will relate to that. I remember listening to, there was some clip that Alex Hormozzi was talking about where he was comparing, like, the different characteristics of the highest performing people. And, like... One of them was they think they're better than everybody else. I've seen this clip. <laughs> yeah. I've and seen this clip. The another one was they never think they're good enough. I think That's I, I might be yeah. paraphrasing that, but um, and then I can't remember the third, probably like perpetual curiosity or something along those lines. Mm-hmm. But um, those first two, it, no one wants to say it because you don't want to seem like an egotistical dickhead, but mm-hmm. like that chip on your shoulder, like it strives for you to be better and you striving to be better creates all of the products and services that run our lives nowadays. Yeah. Yeah. So like, yeah, it is what it is. I, I do agree with that. I, I wouldn't say being competitive is, I think being competitive is a great thing. It, it yeah. iron sharpens iron. You know, I had great people that I, I I've competed with in my life and it's forced me to get better. Um, I just think, sometimes society kind of shuns com- competition because, you know, it can make people feel bad, but you know, where, where I grew up, you know, co- competition was, you know, uh, a highly sought after thing. You know, I was always put in situations to compete and I, I loved it. it. It was a way for me to constantly be outside my comfort zone and push myself to grow. So maybe that's a good way of looking at being an entrepreneur. It's extremely competitive, but you're only competing with yourself stop paying attention to anybody else. Like it literally doesn't matter. Um, your competitors are just as, you know, worried and stressed out as you are like, worry about yourself, worry about your product, worry about your clients and, uh, stop paying attention to all, you know, all these distractions, you know, these people 
that are making it seem like it's easy because it's not. <laughs> Couldn't agree more. Yeah. You look at Instagram and it's all sunshine. Oh, and I, I just stay off that now. It's all jokes. Oh, work four hours a week for a million dollar year. I'm just like, yeah, it's like, no, yeah, no, no. There's a, do you listen to country at all? Yes. Do you listen to Luke yeah. Combs? Yes. So Luke Combs latest album, the last song on the album is called that part. Have you heard mm -hmm. that song? I think so. Yeah. Okay. So if you go listen to it, I want you to think about it through the lens of entrepreneurship. Cause he's saying it through the lens of like uh, a musician on the road, but yeah. it's basically like no one talks about the parts that suck. Right. Like yeah. from a musician, they'll talk about all the women, but they're not going to talk about the one that you miss all the time because you're never home. Right. So yeah. it just, it talks about that comparison. As I hear that song, I can't help but think about the entrepreneurial journey because everyone yeah. talks about the Lambos and the watches and the houses and the yachts and the jets, but yeah. no one talks about like struggling to make payroll. No one talks about the stress that <laughs> hundreds of families rely on your decisions yeah. in order to keep food on their table. Like there's a whole lot more that people don't realize. And, yeah. um, I just, I, I hope that we continue to move in the direction that I feel like we're moving, which is more people having those conversations around that. Because yeah. otherwise, if if we get rid of the competition and people live in a bubble where 17th place is celebrated, when they get into the real world and life punches you in the throat, they don't know what to do with it. They give up. Yeah, and they then they're lured into hard. entrepreneurship through the attraction marketing that is social media that's not yeah. telling the full picture and it's missing tons of context yeah. and you're not prepared to deal with the adversity. It's a massive yeah. problem, I think. Yeah, I think uh, social media for sure sells the 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 lifestyle of, I want to say, easy, right? Like, oh, yeah. but, you know, get into real estate investing. It's going to be easy, right? Oh, you're going to buy 10 homes and you're going to rent them out and you're become a millionaire. Like, <laughs> I don't know why they do that. They're setting every, everybody up for failure. It's just like, yeah. seriously, every, I mean, every, every niche has it, you know, you know, whatever it is, like we're going to marketing agency and we're going to 10 X your marketing within three months. It's like, it's just, you know, you got to stop doing that. You got to be realistic. You know, you got to be honest, you know, set expectations. You got to under promise and over deliver, you know, which I think most people over promise and under deliver, which you know makes it really easy if you're a good person to stand out. But yeah, I yep. couldn't agree more with what social media is, is doing today. 100%. Um, um, let me ask you this. And then we'll, we'll start to recap and wrap up here, because I want to be respectful of your time, Rick. So Handwritten notes, is that something that you were like, is that one of the things that made you so successful in, in sales? And you were just yeah. like, holy crap, this is just really hard to do. Yeah. So my, my, so in 2017, when the idea happened, I was still a medical sales rep. I had like a $50,000 a month quota, which was a kind of an okay size. It wasn't much. Um, and when we had this idea, I got this pen plotter from China and it had no paper feed, so it was really slow. You had to manually put, you know, something there. You had to hit a button. Hope, hopefully, it worked. I mean, it ran off of three different software plugins. You know, it took me about a month just to figure out how to work the thing because um, it was not just a plug and play. But um, after we got it figured out, I had my wife, my parents, like when I wasn't home, like right, let it, making the machine run, and we sent out 500 handwritten notes. And I was using it for sales. You know, I was in sales. I thought it was going to be a cool prospecting tool. 99% open rate, 100% read rate. And I was pitching all these doctors I never worked with in my territory, um, basically like a bundle package that we had. And again, I had a $50,000 quota. I had 28 doctors call me back. I mean, it was about $300,000 in sales, 30, 30 grand in commission. Um, within six weeks, you know, my whole company was going nuts. You know, my VP of sales was like, what are you doing? Like, help us all do this across the country. And, uh, you know, I thought the idea was going to work. I tested it. I saw that it worked. You know, that's when the nuclear explosion, I was like, this is it. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to help businesses do that and uh, put my business on kind of autopilot and then kind of planned my exit. And that's when I, I left January. So uh, 2018, but yeah, handwritten notes. There's just nothing like it. No one's competing in the mailbox nowadays. Like literally go to your mailbox. It's literally like three bills and a couple flyers. Like it's empty versus the nineties where 
you know, the mailbox was full and your email was empty. So it's just what is old is new again, but we have a technology twist in it and we help you automate it or scale it. And if you're in the right industry, you know, if you have a, you know, it's usually, you know, higher ticket item like industries, like the ROI and on attracting new clients is just absolutely awesome. Yeah. Dude, my wheels are spinning. So anyone that's in sales right now or in any sort of customer service should be looking into your product. Where, where do they learn more so about you? Where do you hang out on social? Plug away, my friend. Yeah. So, I mean, it's a great way to, to retain current clients, customer service, right? Build that relationship. Loyalty is royalty. Um, it's, it's a lot easier to retain a client than gain a client. You know, we all know it costs more to acquire than keep. Or it's also a great attraction tool. So for development, but yeah, you can just go to simply noted, just how it's spelled S as in Sam, I M as in Mary, P L Y noted.com. And we always re please request a sample kit because you won't believe us how great this is until you literally get in your hands and you see the technology, you try to smudge the ink, you see the flyers. And then that's when your light bulb moment's going to go off. And then you're going to call us and say, Hey, this is what I want to do. And we help you do it. Or you can just go to LinkedIn. I'm on LinkedIn all day. I'm just Rick Elmore. Um, and I do. I try to do my best to get back to anybody who reaches out within an hour. Boom. Guys, all those will be linked up in the show notes. Get connected. Show some love. Rick, last question I have for you. Going all the way back. Sure. I mean, we'll, we'll start growing up in the athletics world, going to U of A, crushing it there, getting drafted, uh, playing in the NFL, fulfilling that dream, kind of having that moment of realizing like, you know what, it might be time to hang it up, getting into med device sales, crushing it there, uh, going to get your MBA, having this realization around this stat, around handwritten notes, starting Simply Noted, all the trial and error of the different devices and products, mm -hmm. building your own robot, all the way to where you're at right now, absolutely crushing it, largest company doing it in the world. This entire window, what's been the biggest lesson that you've learned that has yielded the most results and had the biggest impact on your life and in your business? Well, number one is your health. Never, ever, ever, ever take your health um, for, <laughs> for granted. Um, you will push yourself past, way past your limits as an entrepreneur. And I've been, um, you know, it makes you sick. Stress will make you sick. And that's something I've learned. So um, taking care of myself, um, Physically is something I made a, a major, uh, I guess, um, investment in the last like two years. And that's what's going to help me keep pushing forward. But um, the longer you're in this game, you, you just realize, you know, it's not about the money. Um, it, it really is about how what you're doing is changing and, and benefiting and helping those around you. And um, five years into this, you know, being able to, you know, have a team, you know, pay my employees or our team members, how I support my family. Um, that's way more important to me um, than why I originally started this. So just the personal growth and how you're affecting those around you is what really is going to fulfill you in the long run. Love it. Rick, thanks for joining me, dude. Really enjoyed this. Thank you so much. Appreciate 100%. it.